there. Welcome to our study in the book of John. I'm glad you could join us today. Today we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, starting at verse 16 down to the end of 18, where the woman at the well, uh, when Jesus says, go get your husband, says, I do not have a husband. So we're going to have a little chat about that. So come with us and see what the Bible says about this. Okay, girls, take us away. Thank you once again for joining us in our Bible study in the book of John. Today we're in chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 16. Last time we met the woman at, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus stopped at. And uh, we started the story there where he promised to give her living water. And she asked for him to give her living water so that she wouldn't have to keep coming to the well. If you haven't seen any of this series, you might want to go to my YouTube channel listed below or to our website, uh, also listed below, and all this series is there. And also the series that I did before called Body, Soul, and Spirit. I think you'll get a lot out of that. You're free to share this with your friends and family. They're not copyrighted, so just be free to share them. So let's just jump right into our study here today. Thanks, girls, for helping out. So I want to go back one verse before we start in on verse 16, because this last verse we did last time, the woman is speaking to Jesus here, and she says, The woman said to him, Sir, give me water that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. So he promised her this water that if you drank it once, you wouldn't be thirsty anymore. Of course, we know that he was talking about spiritual water. We know he was talking about a spiritual life and that uh, he, he is the eternal life, right, that we get through him. Of course, she didn't understand that completely. So she was asking if, if he would give her this water that she could drink that she wouldn't have to keep coming back to the well all the time. So Jesus says to her in verse 16, he said, go call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband, she replied. So it's almost like he was inferring that if you go call your husband and come back, then I can tell you what, uh, what it is that you want to know. I can, I can share with you about this living water. Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And I know that maybe my views on this aren't going to be uh, well accepted or totally popular, but don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just bringing it to you from the Word of God. Jesus says to this woman, go and bring your husband here. And she says, well, I, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, but the man you're with now is not your husband. So we have a situation here that is so prevalent in the world today that many people say, well, what's, why do you have to get married? Like, that's just a, a certificate. You know, I don't need a piece of paper to know whether I love somebody and, you know, we can just live together. We know how prevalent that is, right? When we came and started working in Africa and started working amongst the pastors and training pastors, I was shocked to find out how few of them were married because marriage is an expensive thing here, right? Like it is anywhere. So they always felt that they had to have this big elaborate party and everything that goes along with it in order to be married. And most people couldn't afford that. So they didn't get married. They just started living together. So when we taught on marriage and we taught about these things and taught about the covenant that we're going to talk about today, they come to realize how important it was. So <laughs> I've performed many, many marriages here in Malawi. In fact, one time I was teaching at a pastor's conference. Uh, another organization was holding a big pastor's conference and there was, I don't know, 100 and some pastors at this conference. And again, I taught on this message about being married. And, you know, I just said, it doesn't have to cost so much money, right? It's just a covenant between a man and a wife and God. It's a three-way covenant. So it can be done on a Sunday morning service. Like if a couple wants to get married and they can't afford the whole thing, then just after the service, just, you know, 
make arrangements with the pastor and, you know, they can uh, uh, do a, a, a marriage ceremony there and, you know, ladies can make a little bit of tea or whatever. It doesn't have to be the big elaborate party that everybody wants. Of course, it's nice if you can have that, but not everybody can afford that, right? So I was teaching this at this conference and a whole bunch of the pastors came and said, no, we're not married. We want to get married. We want to get married. So it ended up there was, uh, I think, 12 or 14, no, maybe 15 couples there that wanted to get married. So we just had a big, massive wedding one afternoon. It was ladies made it all up nice. And uh, we just lined all these couples up and we took them through marriage vows and, and stuff. And there was one couple there, an older couple, uh, the pastor and his wife, they were they were in their 70s, early 70s or something. And they've been together for many, many years. Well, you should have seen them. <laughs> we did this marriage ceremony. They were just like two little kids. They were just jumping for joy. It was an amazing thing. So anyways, that's getting a little bit off of our topic here. But it, you know, it's something that, that God wants for us. So I want to look at a couple of scriptures here. Um, Genesis chapter 9, verse 11 to 13 let me just read that. This is one of the first times that covenant is mentioned in the Bible. And it has to do with Noah and the flood. So after the flood was over, I think probably most of us know this, but in case we don't, let me just read it over. I go to Genesis chapter 11, or sorry, Genesis chapter 9, verse 11 down to 13. So the Lord is speaking here and he says, I establish my covenant with you never again, Will all life be destroyed by water of a flood? Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring the cloud over the earth, and the rainbow appears in the cloud, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood and destroy all of life. Now, let me just say something about covenants to begin with. A covenant is an agreement between two parties, or it could be multiple parties. In this case, it was a covenant between God, uh, Noah, and the people that were with him, and all the animals that were with him. God was making a covenant with even the animals. Now, covenant can, can happen in a number of different ways. There can be a one-sided covenant where one person promises to do something, because that's what a covenant is, right? It's a promise, it's a, it's a, it's a contract between one or more parties. God is saying here that he is going to make this contract, this agreement with Noah and his family and all the animals that never again would he destroy the earth with water. And he used the rainbow as a sign to remind him and us that he has made this covenant with us. Now, in this covenant, the only requirement is on God's side. There's no requirement on our side to do anything to fulfill the covenant. Of course, we see the rainbow and we see uh, that reminds us of the covenant that he made with us. Now, covenants are different. Sometimes covenants require something to be done by multiple parties in, in the covenant, in the contract, in the agreement. But in this agreement that uh, God made with Noah, he was the only one that was required to do anything to keep this covenant. So his requirement was that his covenant was what he, what he was saying, what he was agreeing to, was that never again would he destroy the earth with a flood. And as a reminder, he put the rainbow in the sky. So I want to look at another covenant. Actually, I'm not going to take time to read it. You can go over and read it yourself because it, it's quite involved. You can read all of Genesis 17, and it's about the covenant that God makes with Abraham. And uh, that starts more of a two-way covenant. Um, Abraham does something, God does something, and they agree to this thing, and it affects us even today, the covenant that God made with Abraham. So, you know, in this video, that's not what we're uh, going to focus on. So if you want to take time to go and read that in Genesis 17, I think you will be blessed if you, if you do that and see what is being said. 
The next covenant I would like to read from, because this is, this is a covenant that God made with his people that sometimes is a little misunderstanding. I've actually heard this a number of different times lately about this verse uh, as a covenant that God made with his people, and people were saying that now we are actually under part of the old covenant and part of the new covenant because of what God said here. So let me just read it first in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. It says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, and he is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him. People are taking from this verse, from what I just read, this portion that I read, that we are still under the covenant of the Old, of the Old Testament, because, or the, under the Old Covenant, as well as the New Covenant, because it says that God would remain faithful and that he would keep his covenant of love up to a thousand generations, and a thousand generations hasn't passed since this verse has happened. So people are saying that, that we are still under this covenant uh, under the Old Covenant, as well as the New Covenant. But there's, there's three words, four words, from where I stopped that qualify this covenant. Because remember what I said, that a covenant can be one person's required to do something, or it can be that more than one person in the covenant is, is required to do something. So let me just read this whole verse here together. Uh, verse 9. Now, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, he is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. So, God is a covenant-keeping God. He will always keep his covenant. And we thank him that he always keeps his covenant because he is a God of love. He is love. And he, he is good, like always looking for the goodness for us. He always wants to do good for us. But there's a clause in this covenant here. There's a clause in him keeping this covenant for a thousand generations, this covenant of love. There's a clause here. It says, to those, first, to those who love him, and B, those who keep his commandments. Now, when you have a covenant or a contract, that covenant or that contract can be broken by either party. It doesn't have to be broken by both parties. It can be broken by either party. So here, there's two parties here. There's God who's keeping the covenant, faithful love of a faithful God who for a thousand generations, he, he will be faithful to us. For those who love him and keep his commandments. This is where this covenant falls apart because we didn't keep the commandments. We as human beings could not keep the commandments. So we released God from this covenant. By us failing this covenant, we release God from this covenant. If you are going to uh, sell your house, or let's say you're going to buy, your ho buy a house, whatever way, whichever way. When, when you go and make an offer on a house, you put conditions on that offer. Okay, the conditions that the, the inspection is going to pass, conditions that, you know, maybe there's something you want the owner to do before you buy the house. Okay, if, they, if you do this, then I will buy the house, and so on and so forth. But say you get the inspection in the house and you find that half the basement's rotted and the house is ready to collapse and the thing you wanted the owner to do, he didn't do. Then because he broke the covenant, because he broke the contract, now you are freed from that contract because you are not obligated to buy that house. Now, if you go and he has done the thing that he said he's going to do and the inspection comes in that everything is good, now you are required to keep that covenant. Unless you put stipulations, like you can put a stipulation in that covenant that, okay, if my house sells or if I'm able to get financing, then we can buy that house. So if you go and you find out the bank says, well, you know, this, this house is really a little bit too expensive for you. You're not really going to be able to handle this. We really don't want to give you this much money. Then you can say to the other person, I, I can't buy your house because the bank won't give me enough money. Now he is freed from that contract. He is not forced to sell you that house. And you are freed from that contract as well because, because part of the covenant has been broken, right? It, it hasn't been fulfilled. So it's the same thing here. 
God says that he will love us, that he will keep his commandments, and he will keep his covenant up to a thousand generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. But that's the problem with the old covenant. None of us could keep the commandments. And, and the, there was no way that any of us could keep the commandments. And that was the whole point of the old covenant was to show us that we couldn't do it on our own, that we couldn't keep the law, that we couldn't, we couldn't keep things perfect, that we needed Jesus as a savior. So by that happening, we have released God from that covenant that he made with us. We have released him from saying that he would keep this covenant up to a thousand generations. So that's why if you go into Hebrews, and that's not what this message is about, but if you go into Hebrews, it says that that old covenant isn't of value anymore because there's a new covenant that has come and replaced that covenant. Just quickly, time is going on here, but 2 Samuel 18 and 3, we know that David and Jonathan made a covenant together, and you can go and read that. I'm not going to get into that and spend time on that. But they made a covenant to to treat each other, to be friends and whatever. So there's many, many different types of covenant we can get into. And that's what marriage is. Marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman and God. It's a three-way covenant. It's important for that three-way covenant to happen. If you just live together, it's just a two-way covenant. You're just making an agreement, and oftentimes there's no agreement. I mean, sometimes there can be, but oftentimes there's no agreement. You just do it and we'll say, oh, well, we'll see how it works out. And if it doesn't work out, well, we'll go our separate way. And we know how that works, right? So this covenant of marriage between man and woman is very important. This is what God's heart is. I just want to read, uh, there's many places in the Old Testament and the New Testament that talks about marriage. And we're not going to get into doing a lot of teaching about marriage here. But in Ephesians 5 and 31, it says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. God's intent has always been that it be one man, one woman for life. That's always been his intent. And, you know, in the, in the Gospels, it says, well, why did Moses permit a certificate of divorce? And he said, you know, that, that was never God's design. So I know that there's situations in families and stuff that doesn't work out. And, you know, that's the way things are, right? And it's difficult. But this is what God's heart is for his people because he wants the best for us. And his intention is that there would only be sexual relationships between a husband and wife who are married to each other. And that anything else is against what God uh, requires for us as people. Not as law, but because he desires the best for us. He is good and he always wants the best for us and he knows what's best for us. You know, I've quoted that verse so many times here, but I, I think it... We should quote it again in John 10 and 10, that the devil comes to steal, kill. Well, actually, it says a thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give life and give life to the full. So that is God's heart, to give us life to the full. So that's why he gives us these instructions. He tells us what to do. Just like he did with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Because they had been in captivity for 420 years, they didn't know how to live. So they had to tell him what to do. You know, take a shovel with you when you have to relieve yourself and go inside the camp and dig a hole and bury it and do this for cleansiness and do all this stuff because they didn't know how to live, right? So it's the same thing for us. that The, the guidelines he gives us and what he shows us is to help us. It's not to hinder us, it's to help us. And so he's just trying to help this woman at the well where she comes and she says, you know, uh, he asks her to go get her husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. Now, it doesn't say what happened to those husbands. Maybe all those husbands died. Maybe they got divorced. We have no idea. It doesn't say that. But the one that she was with was not her husband. And so this, is, this story is actually a very good story for us to understand because we, we see that Jesus didn't, doesn't approve of that. Like there's a, there's a reason for marriage. He does not consider living together as married because he said to her, you know, go get your husband. She says, no, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. The one you're living with is not your husband. You haven't been married. You haven't, ma you haven't made a covenant between the man, the woman, and God. There's no covenant there. You're just living together. So this is what, what God wants for us. So I just want to thank you for joining me today. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is, is true all the time and that we can depend on your word. We just thank you, Father, that you are always good. 
that you always desire the best for us. We thank you, Father, that you come to give us life and life to the full through Jesus and that we can experience that life when we walk in the principles and the, the precepts that you set before us. So we just ask you, Lord, if any are struggling with this, that you would just be a comfort to them, knowing that you do forgive us and uh, that you set us free from the law of sin and death, that we don't have to feel guilty, but that we can rectify the situations in our life so that we can be more accepted with the things that you want to do and what you want to do in our life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, girls, take us away.